Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael okay, Waits. so I'm Michael Waits. This is the Asia Tech Podcast Stories, and I'm talking to Rob Zapeta. Rob, you're the CEO, the founder, the master of gamification in Asia. Yeah, I guess I guess you could say that. I, I, I don't really know what that means, but um, it's at least, if nothing else, very interesting and something that always uh, keeps me involved in the latest tech trends. So um, it's it, it's it's exciting. Yeah, I mean, to a certain extent, right? So, I, you know, I do media, right? I do a bunch of other things, right? And, and people say, like, every company's a tech company and every company's a media company. But the reality is that every company's a gamification company at some level. No? Yeah, yeah. I think any any subject, I mean, really what it's trying to do is, is make things more efficient and make things, reframe things to be more win-win, uh, align incentives a little bit better so that, Look, if you're trying to actively game the system, all it means is you're just generating a lot of value for that process. And uh, if we're an institution, hopefully we can capture that value. Yeah, so do you want to just back up for people that don't fully understand, right? And I should say, like, I mean, I've kind of not been with you, but I've been with, involved at least at some level with Playbasis from its genesis, right? But maybe it's important for people that haven't been around for the entire time to kind of understand you know, how this started, how you got interested in games, first of all, and then how you kind of moved into the gamification businesses, too. Yeah, sure. So um, I was, um, I think I was a junior or senior in high school when September 11th happened. And I think that um, for a lot of people in my generation kind of uh, started a new chapter in, um, in just... In just life. And uh, at that point, I thought um, it was very important to be more globally minded and uh, to not just think inwardly, but to also think outwardly as well. Like, uh, just just be more globally minded. So, but wait, so where, did, where did you go to high school, though? California. So you're in so California. So California would have been kind of, at least when you were in high school, I mean, it's only like 15 years ago, right? So it's kind of globally situated anyway. But even to get more global was important, I think, yeah? No, that's right. I mean, it was it was a very diverse place. Um, growing up in Southern California, there was uh, it was very diverse. There was a lot of um, a lot of my close friends were actually Filipino. Right. So uh, you know, there was Vietnamese. Uh, you know, myself, I'm coming from a Hispanic American background, so uh, we were already integrated quite well. And being on the Pacific Coast, uh, when you look towards the sunset, you, you think about what's on the other side, and, right. and that's Asia. Yeah. But what does that mean, though, right? So you grew up with this really diverse background. You're you're a gamer, I guess, at some level, right? And then how do you figure out that gamification of businesses? It's not something that a lot of high school kids are thinking about. How do you figure out that that's going to happen, that that's important? And then what brings you to Thailand where you and I met each other? Yeah, I think I was lucky in, in California having been um, a, a place where computers were kind of really um, – uh, integrating themselves into the education system very early, uh, I was able to benefit from that. So uh, a- as a youngster, I was able to uh, uh, start programming and uh, taking college-level courses. Uh, the instructors in the high school weren't weren't able to offer the courses, so they would actually uh, the students in high school would actually go to the, the the local college, community college to take the courses in, in, in web development and web applications. So that was in uh, 2002. So that's when I graduated. So that was just after the dot-com bubble. But, you know, that really, I think, sh- uh, shaped a lot of us because uh, as we're graduating, um, uh, we're also becoming the first iPhone generation, and that kind of shaped a lot of our thinking. So um, following uh, out of high school, I was able, I was able to work for – a major game publishers, uh, international publishers, uh, working for games that were published by Japanese publishers, uh, going to trade shows. Um, some of the game studios I was involved with, involved with in Southern California were actually startups themselves, VC backed. Um, we we had been through M and A where we were uh, under ownership of one publisher, and then we were transferred over to uh, Activision eventually. Right. So uh, I, I was. 
I was sort of uh, exposed to a lot of these things very early on. So um, it was something that kind of was uh, embedded in my skill set from an early, early age. You were lucky in a way, right? I mean, I guess being in California, getting to see not just startups and games, but getting to see some M&A activity. I mean, probably not an IPO activity, but just getting to see sort of beginning to end the whole life cycle of a startup was actually really cool, no? Yeah, it really was. It, it, it really, uh, you're, we're talking about, um, I, 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 you know, worked with people who went on and became very successful independent uh, developers when the App Store first launched. So just understanding how important it is when a new paradigm launches, when a new App Store emerges, uh, how important it is to be at the top when it launches and how long you can stay at the top because just by being in the top 10, uh, you're, you're reaping rewards. So anything you do there on is, is just cream on the top. Yeah. I mean, like one of the first applications that I remember being launched on, um, on the, I, the i store, I mean, the, the Apple store was, um, Instapaper. That's why I had the i in my mind, right? And this was a Marco Armin business. And Marco actually went on to become quite famous and not, not necessarily for that, but he was just there at the beginning of this thing. And I think you're right. If you kind of catch the beginning wave of something and you get it right, the dividends are huge. Yeah, and I think that's what we're seeing in, in why this is relevant now. It's because, uh, you know, as Zynga and as the social gaming mechanics really sort of caught on, uh, they were, they were being applied differently in Asia. And, uh, having the chance to get exposed to Western game development as well as, uh, game development here in Thailand and, and in, and in some of the Eastern publishers, uh, that was very enlightening. The, the 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 consumer behavior of games in Thailand was way different than it was in the U.S. You weren't having people paying sixty dollars for a product upfront at a retail location. You were having people who were members in the internet cafe and had some sort of subscription or credit system. And so that's where the spark of fintech and gaming kind of really started with with myself. Is is that freemium economy, that subscription economy, the in-app purchase economy. Right. I was just going to mention the in-app purchases as well. I mean, that was something that really seems like it was developed out here. Nobody wanted to pay for stuff up front, but they were happy to pay for it bit by bit um, as they went along, whether it was a power-up or a new coin or just a new thing that they had, right? And that, and that made it a very different dynamic than we saw in the United States, I think. Yeah, and, and you started to see the emergence of really powerhouse companies in, in Japan like GRI and DNA and, and some of the Japanese uh, mobile game publishers uh, to the point where it was so effective using these uh, gachapong-style mechanics, these sort of the games of chance, uh, slot machine-style uh, outcomes. It, it was so sticky. It was so in- addicting that the the government of Japan actually uh, ha- had to step in and regulate it, so the game developers had to uh, you know tone it down a bit. I remember that actually. That's it was pretty interesting, and you know, in a way, you got to give the government credit for just being able to react so quickly to something that, in a normal world, they wouldn't really even be paying attention to that, but they were. And that you know, from a developer standpoint, sure, you didn't like the fact that you couldn't make money, but from a user standpoint, it was just like that's the right thing to do. <laughs> Well, it is, and, and, and I've had conversations with, with CEOs of major financial institutions, and you know they've, they've, they've asked me straight, straight to my face, like, um, <clears throat> is this going to be a problem? Are, are we going to have to worry about uh, so, this so, so-called brain hacking or this sort of addiction hacking that, that the, 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 the social networks are, and gaming companies are doing? And I told them yes, and I told them uh, it's important that we know what's happening, and, and it's important that we know that the, there are tools, and we should channel this energy, we should channel this focus towards positive outcomes, win-win outcomes. The pie is so big, there's no need for anyone to be a loser. Everyone can be a winner. So that that's sort of the the, the, the thesis for Playbasis. Yeah, can we back up for a second, though? We, we missed kind of the reason why you came to Asia. Oh yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so um, as I said, I was uh, I was working in, in California, working in the gaming industry, and uh, at, at the time, uh, martial arts w- was a passion of mine. And uh, 
I, you know, I, I was a big fan of sort of a pride in a lot of the K1 and, and Japanese promotions. And I was a big fan of a lot of the, the, the superstars that, that those promotions, uh, generated. And it was early days of the UFC. So I was into, uh, mixed martial arts and especially Muay Thai. I thought Muay Thai was the best and, and, and for me, my most favorite martial art. So, uh, I did come out here on, on a few different, uh, occasions, uh, to just to train, to spend basically, uh, you know, three, four weeks in just the, boot camp environment and just train and, and come back to California and actually uh, have, have have a performance. Right. I mean, at some point, though, you decided to move out here, right? So you must have done some freelance programming or just some freelance gaming work as well, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, <clears throat> actually, when I was back, in, when, before I moved out, I actually had a side, uh, my first sort of quote-unquote startup was... Um, I had a blog, a sports blog, and it was something I was maintaining when I was uh, in my free time, uh, still working, you know, for the studio, for the game studios, and uh, doing stuff on weekends. And it, it was for an NFL team, and it got syndicated by uh, Sports Illustrated by uh, AOL. I was able to do um, radio spots with ESPN Radio. We, we were doing a podcast back then as well. We did about twenty episodes. Uh, we reached a million. Uh, uh, m- monthly viewers, and we were generating a uh, nice income. And um, we, we we were approached by at the time um, a small company called SB Nation. SB Nation, and, <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> small company. <laughs> well, they were much smaller at the time. I'm sure. And uh, they did make an offer, and I uh, you know I turned it down because I thought you know that was a passion of mine. Um, I didn't want to work for anyone. I just wanted that to be something that. I was passionate about, but I could still generate a bit of free free cash flow, and that helped me to uh, to take trips around the world. So, what happened to that blog? Uh, it's it's really hard to follow American sports when you're in Asia. Tell it's, me about uh, it. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> so uh, it's been sort of you know, there's been lots of small acquisition offers, but uh, it's still sitting around. Uh, but no, it's it's completely dormant. And I'm sure all of us, we we have a handful of domains in our back pocket that we've always thought, you know, maybe one day this is my 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 lucky ticket. I can cash this this amazing domain that I've got stored up. But the reality is, you know, just let it go. Yeah, I've got hundreds of those. I don't think they're going to turn into anything though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you so better put the work in. But I, I like this concept you were talking about. Like when you play a game, everybody can win, right? It sounds a little bit hippy dippy, but I don't think you mean it that way. I think you really mean like it can create a win win situation for people in the sense that you know companies can use gamification. I think that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah. To be able to create experiences for consumers where both of them, where like the companies get better engagement, but the consumers also get some benefit for participating in whatever that gamification process is. But I think it's more complicated than that sort of surface level explanation. Do you want to talk a little bit about how like Playbasis itself came to be and just how hard it was and how hard it is actually just to maintain it, to fund it, to build it, to hire people, like that whole process of building your own startup from scratch. Yeah, so we got started in uh, 2012 uh, initially as something that we thought was going to be a, uh, a web plug-in component. You know, there, there were companies in 2012 like Discuss, Facebook Comments had just launched, um, you know, Zynga within the iframe of Facebook was doing um, good things, but they were also launching the uh, Facebook like button. So we thought we were going to get distribution across e-commerce companies and, and, and companies that had a lot of traffic. But uh, you know, the, just it just there were some things that weren't the market just wasn't ready yet. I think it really wasn't until mobile, and especially when Pokemon came along, that uh, it really sparked everyone's interest in what gamification could be. Uh, but what was, what was the impact of Pokemon? Like, why did that matter? Well, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of things we can learn from it, and I think the thing that uh, some of the detractors would, would say is, oh, it doesn't have that consistent engagement. It's this huge spike, and so on and so forth. But 
just from an economic standpoint, from an ROI standpoint, uh, yeah, Pokemon was so successful that even in their best case scenario, they were off by 50x. And they were the fastest company to generate $1 billion in revenue. I think in 12 months, they did $1.2 billion. And, and they, they didn't even spend not even 10% of that on, on the product itself. That was all organic. And they were the fastest com- company to 500 million downloads, and that was just in two months. And so I think what, what people learned about that was gaming is probably the most mass form of media. If you talk about going into any country around the world, very hard to find one that has a ban on gaming as a form of media. Uh, there's different rules around movies and radio and TV and other types of media, uh, print media, but in terms of gaming, it's pretty much very mass. It's, it's, it's 50, 50 men, women. It's the average age of a gamer in the U S is like 35 years old. So it's, it's mass mass. And, Companies have never really had tools to use this marketing uh, or to use this media in their marketing, uh, but now it's starting to become something that um, a lot of companies are interested in doing. So when Pokemon came out, there were a lot of companies looking to spend money on Pokemon. There were CEOs out here. There were insurance companies, banking CEOs saying, let's put some Pokemon in our business. How can we tap into that? And Pokemon wasn't designed for it. It didn't have the media channels, the advertising channels that Google, YouTube, and Facebook did. It was just something that was virtual goods based, virtual economies, you know, microtransactions based. It was it was a uh, 1.2 billion in this virtual goods, these virtual coins, Poke coins. What um, what, then, what year was what year did that launch, and what platform was that again? Just to remind me. That was um, uh, June of 2016, and it was one year ago, basically. Ah, uh, so you're talking about this new this new game, yeah? I mean, the one where people like run around and search for people and try to try to find the monsters behind trees and that kind of thing. So yeah. you're not talking about yeah. something earlier, okay? But yeah. that, that's a while after you launched, though, right? It it was it was that's right that's right. But that I think created a spark, and that was also around the time when we made a pivot into. Fintech. We we stopped going after some of these other uh, segments of the market, and we really doubled down on uh, financial institutions as customers. So tell me how that's tell me how that's different than what you were doing before, what you were focusing on before. In other words, before it was kind of like you want, you would gamify anybody's business, and now it's just okay. The money's in fintech. We're just going to double on fintech, yeah. Yeah, at first it was like, can you get us more likes? Can you get us more downloads? Can you be a, a, an optimization engine, a transaction engine for us to get more shares or recruits or or friend referrals? And right. and as you go down that funnel, you realize what, what at the very end it's, it's the transaction. And how can we facilitate more transactions? And uh, what we did was we were able to switch from a SaaS model and move towards a performance-based or success-based model because we have enough data now, having done partnerships with huge huge banks around uh, Asia. Uh, we've kind of understood what, what, what kind of value we're able to generate and how much of that value we're able to capture. So it was always my understanding, right, that the gamification business was supposed to be a SaaS business, right? So you sell the software as a service to people, they pay a monthly subscription fee, and you just get paid, at, you know, for the three years or five years of the contract. That seems like a great business to me. But you're saying that that wasn't the most, the, the optimal way to do this, right? Yeah, I think that works for, a com- like, that works for a reporting company, that works for a, a company like a zero, that works for something where, you're just reporting on a data set, but what we're doing is we're actually trying to grow a number. We're trying to take a KPI from where it is today and think about how we can increase that over a period of time and what mechanics or what techniques we can use uh, to do that. And as we've learned, we're able to actually, I mean, 
by charging a flat rate, we're missing out on so much of the upside that we're generating. So we, we, we start to figure out what kind of uh, pricing we can really charge for this product. So we believe one of our customers was getting a 50x ROI, like what they <laughs> invested versus what they generated was 50 times. So we believe we've got at least 10x built in the business without anything except for a pricing tweak. Yeah, I mean that's pretty amazing, right? And that's a that's a great learning because in my mind, you know, every time I thought about Playbasis, I thought, okay, the more clients you put on the platform, and I think everybody thought the same thing, right? The more clients you put on the platform, the more monthly revenue that you get, and then it it's just like an annuity; it just goes forever. But the reality you're telling me is that in this for this particular business, because there is so much upside, right? In other words, they spend a dollar, but they get a hundred dollars back. You should get some portion of that revenue, and if they get a thousand dollars back, you should get some of that, as opposed to just taking, you know, whatever the monthly SaaS fee is. Yeah, right. And and once and once we can do that, then we can basically onboard customers for free. Essentially, we can basically say, no cost, just try it, and we get them on board, and then we just share in the upside. But that's how that's something we've only been able to uh, you know achieve today and so that's why our story today is much different than it was maybe one or two years ago but that's interesting for me right and i i didn't know that but that's actually makes the story so much more compelling right so how long have you been how long have you guys been running that model so in in around the same time we we announced in 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 the summer of 2016 we announced our partnership with Visa hmm. and I think that was something where they also saw you know um this this could be a benefit to their issuers um right. so they did a lot of introductions with us and that also generated a lot of positive uh press with us so we were able to have a lot of conversations with a lot of banks and even insurance companies, wealth management companies all around Asia. We've been able to actually join different accelerator programs or business matching programs. And our most recent sort of uh, program we've been accepted into is the uh, Tokyo Metropolitan uh, FinTech program. I saw that. Uh, I yeah. saw that actually. Yeah. yeah, but what's and so what's the benefit to you for that? And I guess the other question is, so you spent from 2012 to 2016 trying to con, you know building great technology, obviously, right? But trying to convince potential customers, you need this service and you need to pay us. And I'm going to make up a number, right? Because I don't know what it is. But let's say it was a hundred dollars a month for this, and, and the clients went mm, maybe. But now you can go back. Do you see that when you go back to the same clients and say, you know what, never mind about the monthly fee. We'll install this and train you how to use it, and we'll do it for free. But all we do is we have KPIs, and there are seven, whatever the KPIs are. And if we increase those KPIs, we get paid based on success. So have you seen the sales cycle become, like, easier or just faster? Well, that's right. So that's, But that's where we're finding ourselves stuck because we went from maybe a one-year sales cycle. If we, were, if we really took an intellectually honest view at the company we could say okay that we did a we had for some of our early deals some of our early deals that's probably a one-year sales cycle and we managed to today turn that down to less than six months three months but can we make it much faster absolutely the problem we we have is we're capital constrained at the moment right so but what does that mean what does that mean exactly right for people that are listening I think I get it. In other words, you can't get more clients unless you have more salespeople and it costs money to have salespeople. Is it that type of capital constraint? That means on average we're getting one, for, let's call it Fortune 500 Global 2000 company uh, inbounding to us without us spending marketing dollars. Right. Yeah. And we're only about to take, we're only able to take about 0 0.5 to 1 of those per month just because of capital constraints. Right. So just your ability to onboard board them. In other words, so if you had, if you had more capital, if you weren't capital constrained or you had some capital you could allocate to either A, marketing or B, onboarding, from a customer demand perspective, how many clients do you think you could onboard in a regular month just based on the existing demand you have? 
it would be one a week, and we're talking major European banks, major Asian banks, I mean, major banks, right, like global banks. And we're, what we're doing is our main product was uh, something that activates payments, and a lot of banks are trying to generate more volume on their mobile banking or, or e-wallet solutions. But what we're finding is that a lot of the um, – uh, margin within the bank, I think. I mean, where people make money in a bank is in some of their other products. Like what? So in, well, increasingly wealth management, you know, equities, uh, mutual funds, uh, anything you can do around that, you know, even generating loan applications. Uh, those can be, you know, home loan, more mortgage applications. Those are, you know, anytime you can, you know, generate a return on those things, um, that's good for a bank because, and that's even a harder problem for banks in Japan. I mean, they make almost no money at this point. So it's a very interesting problem right now in Asia versus the U.S. Can you explain that to me? I'm really curious. So you have a bank that wants to increase something. Right, and then you gamify it or you use your platform. Can you just tell me exactly kind of step by, without giving away the secret sauce, obviously, but just to educate me, just tell me how that would work, again, in a non-capital constrained world, right? So you go into a client and you tell them what, and if it's a bank, what's the product that they have? What's the KPI? And then how do you actually go about increasing it? Like, how does it work so well? Like you said, one client increased their KPI by 50 times. That's a lot. Yeah, so basically <clears throat> for for one of our banking clients, uh, you know, they were able to, you know, we created a game which was activated based on a credit card spend or credit card swipe. <clears throat> and when you do that kind of a game in a rich country like Hong Kong, Singapore, Tokyo, Paris, you can generate a lot of spend during that time. But why? Why was – and again, I'm asking, right? Like, so I have a credit card and you say it's generated on a swipe. But I'm not – if I'm online, and I presume if I'm online or mobile, right, I'm not swiping anything unless I'm missing the the, the sort of way this works, the logistics of how it works, right? What does it mean exactly? Well, for most of our company, most of our clients, they've, they've made a significant investment in their mobile application. So right. they're trying to generate usage of that or generate new users of that. So – you're starting from already a base of tens of thousands. Okay. So, you know, when we can work from a bigger number, and even if we can increase that by a small amount, but, you know, normally it's a huge amount, uh, we can generate huge upside. So that's a 50x increase. For, I mean, that's a 50x ROI on them for them. And that was only constrained by how much rewards they were willing to give back. So uh -huh. what we learned was the key to gamification in Asia is there's got to be some online to offline value based reward for it to get really sticky. And that number flowing through our system every month is a huge number. And we're really not taking any percentage of that yet. Right. So what is that reward? In other words, so let's say, I don't know, it's a Citibank credit card, right? And it says, if I use this card, I get what? Well, I mean, think, I mean, typically these companies are willing to give anywhere from 1% to 15% in cash back. So there's no technology right now to manage that money, that budget. I mean, there's no, if you think about like referral bonuses or, you know, getting, getting, um, matches on your investments or even getting like a, a bonus for opening an account, getting a thousand dollar bonus. There's no system managing. That's still very paper based. Really? So if you can somehow optimize that for people, use AI and do that at scale and have a look at how that happens across Asia and how different banks are doing it and what the right pricing should be, then you can almost create kind of a pricing engine for this uh, subsidy. Very interesting. And you gamify that whole process? Yeah, we try to convert. So when a bank comes to us and says, you know, when we have to figure out <clears throat> what the payback period is, we need to know what KPI we need to reach. So if it's a um, home loan application, for example, if our solution can generate 10 home loans for them, right. that paid for itself. If it's, uh, you know, a mutual fund and, you know, maybe let's say a mutual fund, they make, you know, an expense ratio of 1%, then we've got to, figure out how we can get 10 million assets under management. And if we can gamify that somehow by creating a, uh, 
a new banking app category, um, that's great. But that's really, so are you creating one-off solutions for clients or do you have kind of off-the-shelf stuff that you mix and match for people that they can use so that the cost for you to actually service a new client is not that high or is this really bespoke stuff that you build for every client? No, we're figuring out what the app, you know, we're having lots of conversations and sometimes we do one-off things, but we figure out what's really working and what's scalable. We're finding out what products we can we can create what categories we can create and what we can drive a lot of value for. So at the moment, our most popular is, uh, you know, product is an SDK, which means we provide a full game, a full rewards wallet, a full coupons wallets inside. Think of it as just a zip file, which they can put inside their app. And, and all of a sudden they can add a whole new menu or a whole new system to their mobile app. So our distribution is because we've been able to embed this in a lot of very popular mobile apps around Asia. So we've got 10 million users on the platform, 5 million monthly active. If we onboard a big customer, that could be another 2, 3 million monthly active just right there. So we're looking at a lot of very interesting economic activity across Asia. Yeah, and I guess, I guess... If you have one sort of insurance company sign up and then you have another bank sign up, while their businesses are slightly different, like externally on the back end, it's really just some kind of finance or fintech business, right? And I guess at some level, can you anonymize that data and share that data across your entire platform so that even if it's not the bank's client, they can they can benefit from the activity and sort of the gamification learnings that you have from a different client's base? Yeah, I mean, that's this very sensitive question that we get asked because sometimes, you know, we, we, we actively have conversations with, with, with regulators and right. we make sure that we go and we talk to Bank of Thailand. You know, Monetary Authority of Singapore, Singapore invites us in issues, uh, an edict for gamification within, you know, fintech solutions. You know, so we talk to, you know, in Hong Kong as well. And, and they're very encouraging of these kinds of things. Um, the, the idea, though, is that hashing and encryption and these types of things is a very, very important thing to do. And not a lot of companies do that. And, uh, you know, that's something that people don't think about. But sometimes the technology, com- t- technology companies are more equipped to do than the traditional financial institution guys, right. especially some of the very old banks who really haven't implemented their digital transformation strategy yet. Yeah, and do you think, are they just far behind because they've never had to focus on that style of business yet? In other words, like how does it compare to what's going on in Europe and the United States? Well, I mean, <clears throat> in some ways, the Asian Asian companies, Asian banks are moving faster, much faster than the European and and the the, uh, North American banks. But um, the idea is that it's much harder for a bank to become an internet company than it is for an internet company to acquire a banking license. Is it really? (laughs) So if you're competing in a digital world, in an engagement-based world, and you're an internet company with a banking license, of course you're going to be at an advantage versus you're a bank that – all of a sudden is trying to build a digital business. So does that, and again, this is just way way out of left field, but does that argue for you guys getting a banking license or an insurance license and then just like gamifying everybody else out of business? Uh, At at the moment, no. Uh, At the moment, most of our clients look at us in some way as a hedge against, I mean, honestly, the banks are not that competitive or... We, we haven't really had a problem with exclusivity rights within markets against fellow banks. They're actually mostly concerned with the internet companies. I mean, those are the guys that they're very concerned about that they look at as, as they look at as disruptors. That's so, fascinating, actually. Yeah. So when we are able to offer basically a lucky money program, just in the way Alipay off, you know, has, then the banks are like, we want to incorporate that into our into our app as well because we want to drive engagement and stickiness with our products. So there's just a lot of growth because the, pro- the, the still most of the banks only have about 10% mobile penetration 
versus total accounts. So there's still a 10x built into business. Right. So there's a story here, I think, that some investors are missing, right? And I don't want to get into the weeds and ask, like, how much money you're raising and all that kind of stuff. We've had conversations like this before, but I'm really wondering why, if there's 10x or 50x built into this business model, right? And I, I, I trust that what you're saying is true, right? I've been in and out of looking at gamification business for the last four or five years, right? I, I think I get how this works. Why do you think it's so hard to fund if you can comment on that? You know, again, without mentioning anybody's name or how much money it is, I'm just wondering, like, why are people missing this? Is it, was it, is it just too early? Like, I, I don't understand. Uh, it, it's been early. I mean, you know, for example, we've grown 500% year over year in terms of revenue. <laughs> right. Then that would argue for some silly and venture we'll capitalist. And we'll grow another like- 500% next year and, and two more years actually. And that's built into the business. The thing is that the product today, which we might charge, let's say, for example, $20,000 a month. Right. Um, was basically the genesis of a product that we sold three years ago for $200 a month. Right. So we've just built a lot of value into the system, into the, into the, into the assets. Right. So I'm just saying it's it just arguing to get funded because uh, you're talking about capital constraints. And I presume without you saying it explicitly that that means it's hard to raise money to grow the business. When you don't have to agree or disagree with that. But I just wonder why investors are missing this. If there's 500% annual growth in it, it just seems like something someone should just scoop up right away. No, I mean, there's actually a lot of interest right now. Good. Uh, okay, that's good. That, that's yeah. that's what I wanted to know. Yeah. And that's a that's a change. That's like a sea change from what it was a year or two ago, right? When the pricing of the product was different and sort of the methodology for earning the money was different, right? I mean, there's uh, – there's, you can call it a, a, a ceiling or a gap, but, you know – just going from A to B, that's a huge, uh, you know, that's a huge step. I mean, that's more difficult than people realize. What, Series A to Series B? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you want to tell me why you think that that's the case? Is it a is it a regional thing? Is it a local thing? You know, I, I just get the sense that a company that's growing 500% annually should be simple to fund. Um, I think people really get just get very caught up in the round number, or the round letter, or the uh, amount of financing that you've had in history. Um, so, so that, what they're saying, you've already raised like two and a half million bucks. How come you're not further along, kind of thing? Maybe some of that. Maybe some of that. Or you know, um, uh, you, you might even be able to raise money that you know is a Series A. But for some companies, they probably raised that at seed. At no. seed, right? Yeah, fair yeah. enough. Yeah, so you know, it's com- investors have a hard, have had a hard time looking at how they can really pump money into this company and really see it grow, and that's obviously been my fault because it's hard. It's been hard for me to really tell that story, but now having done enough validation of the experiments, having a full year of finance, you know, financial data under our history, plus. Engagement data in big data, really. I mean, you're talking about annually. That's over a billion data points around payments. Right. So that's very monetizable. Yeah, I mean, but again, you've already said like there's ten times, twenty times, maybe fifty times in individual clients to do it. Right now, you're you're onboarding half a client a month or three quarters of a client. You could do one a week if you just had the resources to do it. This seems to me like, and this is not a comment to you. This is a comment to. You know, any venture capitalist who's listening, and there are plenty that are listening, if you're not funding this business, you're missing something, it seems like to me, no? I mean, that's just my (laughs) opinion. You don't have to answer that, right? But that's just my opinion. And part of the reason for me talking to companies is to figure out, you know, if the people that are out there that are listening and trying to invest in businesses, I feel like they're missing sort of secular changes and, and big changes in businesses like yours where they're saying, you know, maybe I looked at it a year ago, but they're not understanding that things change over time and they're just being really myopic. Sorry, this is just me getting on a soapbox a little bit, right? But I feel it's like... It's fair. It's very fair. But that's my I job, mean, right? I'm allowed to do that. This is not something you could necessarily say or other company founders can say, but I can say whatever I want. And it just appears to me that this is a easily fundable business. And if you're a venture capitalist and you're looking at this business and you're not paying attention, you're missing something. And you're actually doing your own limited partners a disservice 
it seems to me, by not investing in a business that has done so much research, so much experimentation, has now, has now solved, to the extent that any business problem is solvable, um, both a pricing and a distribution mechanism, this should be invested, I think. Anyway, that, that's not a question. Well, that's, that's just my comment, that's, right? I mean, look, I mean, that, that's very nice of you to say, but I think the, the, th- the, thing, the thing that inspired me to even start the company was I, I knew that the word gamification, the topic, was going to have some, some rough years, some rough waters. For and sure. We're, you know, as an industry, if we really want this to, to be, you know, to, 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 to live up to the vision, then we're going to have to work hard to make sure that we really bring interesting solutions to the market. So when you look at the AR trend, the VR trend, all of these companies, they're using gaming tools to, sure. to create these types of media. So, sure. I mean, we're definitely, we feel that we're in the right category. And, you know, in, you know, raising funding would obviously be, um, be something that we're always going to explore. But, you know, what we've learned is that uh, you really can't rely on the next round coming every time. If you don't have the economics built into your business, if you don't have a basic business model in place, you just can't survive. So the good thing for us is that we've actually got that and we're able to sustain ourselves cash flow from operations already. Right, which is awesome. And that's you've actually touched on a really important topic for someone like I am, right, as, a, as an investor and somebody who's wanted to build their own venture capital fund. I think what you're basically saying is that you want to build a business, go out and build it. In a way, like self-fund it. Because you can't count on people to understand um, the returns that are associated with the risks they're taking. And frankly, if you can fund it yourself, you're better off anyway. I wonder I wonder what happened. You know, back in the day, we used to, I'm trying to remember the names of these companies, right? But there, was a, there were other companies globally that were doing this, right? Like Badgeville. Did I get that name right? Yeah. So I think the main difference that, you know, you know the lesson... Two things. One is I feel like the, the gamification that speaks to Gen Y maybe is a little bit different than the gamification that speaks to Gen, Gen X, and that's not a slight to anyone. No, because I love games. But right. the fact is, I we grew up on Sony PlayStation. I right. mean, uh, so that was 3D right there. So the expectations for gaming is just kind of a generation or two beyond uh, Pac-Man and Pong. Right, and some of the Game mechanics were very basic. It was really around just points, badges, a high score table, and they were going to be widgets, which were they were essentially selling. Their distribution channels were Microsoft, SharePoint, IBM, you know, uh, whatever intranet program they have to HR departments or sales teams or whatever. So, um, you know, that's the route they took, and it didn't really work out. Um, the difference with us is we saw the change to mobile much earlier, especially in Thailand being such a mobile first co- uh, country right. that we started building a lot of our competency, a lot of our SDKs natively in mobile. A lot of our APIs are built specifically to tap into some of the mobile data. You're talking about step tracking data, health data, GPS data. You're, all these data points you can use when you're talking about underwriting or scoring behavior so we, we really feel like we're sitting on an engine that, uh, you know, we can really grow. Yeah. I mean, I've been rooting for this business. I'm going to keep doing it. I, I think there's something here. And this may be one of those things that's an overnight success, like six years in the making. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Maybe, maybe. But you know what lucky. I mean, though, right? And yeah. I guess my last question is: Do you think? And I don't know the answer to this question, right? But do you think that maybe there's a there's a marketing problem just for the name of the service that you're providing? Do you know what I mean? Like, do you think you walk into an office of you know a big bank and you say we're going to gamify this? Like, we don't do games. Do you think there's some of that or no? It's changing a little bit. It's changing a little bit. You're seeing that today's day and age. You're starting to see. The, the 30 year olds, I mentioned I'm 33 myself, right. some of these people entering into becoming vice pres, pres, vice presidents, senior vice presidents, or maybe they're taking on the digitization of their family business. You're starting to see that they're much more open to the idea of having been digital natives, essentially gamified from birth. And in a place like Thailand, gaming is not a bad word. It's something, you know, right. even gimmick is not a bad word in Thailand, if you're really honest. I mean, they're happy to think about interesting gimmicks. They can do anything to kind uh, of okay. create a buzz. 
uh, and so uh, there's a lot of people who here who are very auspicious, and you can incorporate in, that into the gamification as well. So that's been very fun, incorporating elements of feng shui, for example. In Japan, there's blood types which we might be able to tap into to create interesting games. So right. anything can be gamified. I mean, it's really you're talking about a universe of potential. Right. So how do I get my podcast gamified so that I can get more people to listen to it and get more downloads? <laughs> well, I mean, I think Amazon was brilliant in their acquisition of Twitch and this whole idea of live streaming or having, you know, people, you know, having this chat bar, people who are sort of interacting with the podcast, whether it's having a, a voting system in real time or having a game where you're doing a pop quiz with your audience. You know, if you think about a lot of very successful radio shows out there, having a little mini game inside or a game show was always you know, very big, for example, Howard Stern and things like that. So right. uh, you can have little mini games inside radio shows, no problem. But let's say I did that, right? So one of the podcasts that we do, and this is a real question, right? One of the podcasts that we do, we do live every week. So every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock, we jump on to, um, t- to Twitter and we broadcast live. So you suggesting that as part of that, for a five-minute period of time, we run a sort of inside-the-podcast relevant topic game that's associated with what we're talking about and see if we can get people to participate in that? And if we do, does that mean we have to give away a prize for someone as well? Well, that's the thing. I mean, the, the, the beautiful thing is that, uh, yeah, a prize is great, but it doesn't have to come out of your pocket necessarily. If there's a brand out there that uh, is happy to kind of sponsor that, you know, that's something that, you know, is considered native advertising, but it's not a type of advertising that people are trying to block or skip over. They're actually right. trying to capture that. So it's very compelling. Right. So I can do something like this. And again, I'm just making this up off the top of my head, but it's an interesting topic for me, right? So I say, okay, at the end of the podcast, we're going to do, we're going to give away a free subscription to the Financial Times, which is, you know, I'm, I'm making up or the Wall Street Journal, right? So sponsored by the Wall Street Journal. And to do that, you have to rank this or do something and win that little game. And we just give it away. And I guess in, to a certain extent, it's information for the brand as well. They see if anybody's participating, who wins, what the answers are. Like, is that information that they care about as well? Absolutely. I mean, think about an Uber or an Amazon today. Who doesn't have a scoring system? Who doesn't have a customer scoring system? You have to have some sort of point system, scoring system to layer on top of your intelligence. Okay. Well, you've given me an idea. Look okay. <laughs> anyway, look, I think I've taken up as, um, enough of your time today. I really wanted to thank you, Rob. Um, is there a way that people can contact you, or is there something else that you'd like to tell people before we sign off? No, I mean, we're we're, we're just on fa- um, uh, playbasis.com and on LinkedIn. We're very active, so feel free to reach out. But uh, you, thank you very much. Do, and, do you uh, tweet as well? I do, I do. I'm on, I'm on Twitter at Rob Zepeda. So okay. you can follow me there as well. Playbasis has a Twitter account as well. So uh, mostly it's B2B type stuff. But, uh, you know, I figure if I talk enough about this topic, uh, people will eventually uh, remember me when they're searching for it. Good stuff. So you can find us at Asia Tech Pod or at Michael Waits on Twitter. Obviously, we've got a Facebook page for Asia Tech Podcast on Facebook. I'd like to thank Rob Zapata of Playbasis for coming on and um, spending some time with us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Cheers, man. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.